Xcode improvements, macros in Swift, and core data replacement. The news has already cooled down a bit after WWDC. It's time to take a fresh look at the major changes. In other words, how did the latest Apple Keynote affect the engineers? Subscribe to our channel so you won't miss fresh news about iOS and macOS engineering. I'm Serhii Botenko, an engineer at CleanMyMac, and here we go with the news. Let's skip all the product updates. You might have already read about them all over the media. Instead, I will briefly update you about the key changes that affect our work, as well as about new APIs. We will start with Xcode, a tool where we spend most of the working hours. Here are the five most important Xcode 15 updates. Number one, Xcode is decreased in size even more. If you choose only the macOS SDK, the GMG file weighs just under 3 GB. And unpacked Xcode takes 10 GB. This is the half the size of Xcode 14. Number two, Xcode got improved auto-completion. Once you create a class in an empty file, Xcode will suggest the file name as the name of the class. Number three, Xcode killed or rather shadowlocked SwiftGAN, RSwift, and other similar tools. Xcode 15 generates type-safe symbols for images and colors from XCS set files. For example, here we have the main use preview image. Xcode generates this variable and updates it when it's renamed or deleted. Number four, string catalogs. There are some dramatic changes here. Apple has completely changed the format of how translation files are stored. There will be just one file instead of separate files for each language. Therefore, changing the localization key will affect all the languages, so you won't miss any key. There will be also a check in case of missing translations for any language. And if you change the original value, Xcode will mark all translations as needs review. Number five, last but not least, a new Quick Actions panel is available in the latest Xcode. You can access it by pressing Command Shift A. This panel allows you to call any action from menu bar or context menu. For example, you can create a new file or rename a variable. Looks like a bunch of tiny changes, but they might significantly improve your daily work. Let's move to Swift. The most exciting feature is Macros, which allows you to eliminate a bunch of boilerplate code. Check out the list of open source macros via the link in the description below. For example, there is a macro to generate an init with all public variables, so you don't have to update it when you add a new variable. Or generate a mock for a class for unit tests. And the second feature is that, that if else and switch statements now return a value. Here you would have to write a return for each case return fail, return pass, and so on. Now there is no return at all. It's time for SwiftUI. There are new types of animations. The first type is a keyframe animation. First, we create a view that you want to animate. And then we create animations that are applied in parallel. This way, you can create a fairly complex animation, where we move an object, rotate it, and resize it. The second type is phase animation. Unlike the previous animation, we set the phases applied in sequence. First shrink, then spin, grow, and reset. Now elements appear on the screen could be animated too, with a new API in scroll view. Look at this stunning animation. It can be done just by adding a few lines of code. Tons of changes that can save you dozens of code lines are about macros. Instead of observable object protocol, you can use observable macro for the class. It will automatically add the observable object protocol and make all the variables published. I highly recommend you to watch Discover Observation in SwiftUI session to get into it. Swift Data is a new data storage framework that replaced core data. Now you don't need to create a database scheme. Everything is described in a data model, like your model is your scheme. To make a class available for storage, you need to add the new model macros before the class declaration. To get this data in the Swift UI, you just need to create a variable with a query macro and set up a sorting if you need some. Two lines of code and we have a data storage. To be honest, we still need to configure the container. But it is one more line of code. If you don't use Swift UI, you can get the models using fetch descriptor. Take the context from the container, set up a request and execute it. 
Almost the same as working with an SFH request from core data. And finally, spatial computing and spatial design. I was pretty short on time to fully dive into these sessions, so don't miss the complete review in the upcoming episodes. Today I will recommend you the sessions available on this topic. There are plenty of them, so let's figure out which ones you should start with. The first session is Get started with building apps for special computing. This is the base, the basis for work. It's about the foundational elements of special computing – windows, volumes and spaces – and how to use it to build a special app. The second session is Design for a special user interface. It's about displaying with phones, colors, and windows transparency you use to design a perfect interface. And the third session is designed for special input. It's about designing applications that are user-friendly and easy to use with your eyes and hands. For example, to attract user attention, you should create smooth shapes such as circle or rectangle with rounded corners, squiggles. This trick helps the eye to focus on the center of these shapes, not their edges. And the fourth session is Meet Swift UI for Special Computing. Now that we figure out what to do, we can move on to how to do it. Develop a real app. If you want to read the brief updates, Apple has a page with tech descriptions for different topics, such as UI Kit, Swift UI, or Xcode. Check out the link in the description below. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. See you in the upcoming episodes.